so I wanted to do a quick update to start off this vlog. I have just finished part one of Throne of Jade, which is the sequel to His Majesty's Dragon. That was one of my most surprising books of 2023. I read it in December, I think, of 20... yeah. November of 2023, totally expecting to hate it, totally expecting to DNF it, and it ended up being the biggest surprise, if not one of the biggest surprises at least. And I think it made an honorable mention in my top books of the year because I loved it so much. So I'm reading the sequel now and I'm already enjoying it so much. So, um, okay. Book one followed Lawrence, who was a naval man, and uh, when they took a ship, they took a prize, which was a dragon egg. And due to a number of circumstances, Lawrence ended up being the one bonded to the dragon and the new dragon rider. His whole life got turned upside down. He had to learn the dragon riding way, uh, get to know other dragon riders, get to know their new culture and traditions and expectations and fighting styles. And it was a wonderful first book. Plus, probably the greatest part of the book is Lawrence and Temeraire. Temeraire is the dragon's name. Their bond, their connection, their love for each other. Um, Lawrence is a very flawed character. Some of his perspectives are um, traditionalist. <laughs> Some of his perspectives are very much what he has been raised with as a naval man, um, you know, fighting in this war, in the Napoleonic Wars. And so going to this dragon riding culture where men and women are treated equally, um, they, it's just, it was different, but he learns, you know, he grows, he learns, we move. And now in book two, it looks like we're starting to get some inklings of his views on the world also being challenged. Um, the Chinese government is curious because this dragon egg, this rare beast was theirs. <laughs> and they're like, you can't have it. You shouldn't have bonded with this dragon. It's it's ours. And they want them to sever the bond. They want the dragon back. They want Temeraire back. Lawrence fights for his dragon, fights for their bond, uh, fights for what Temeraire wants. And it's beautiful. It's a great beginning. It's a very, it's a very slow paced start to the book, but um, it's also beautiful because of Lawrence and Temeraire's bond. Uh, there's a lot of politicking going on. There's a lot of tension as Lawrence is trying to navigate this new challenge that they have. There's also some cultural things being brought up like, um, you know, the West bringing in their culture and their, uh, their, their formative ways into other cultures that don't want it. Or there's mention of slavery, which Lawrence uh, views quite casually. And it's being very lightly kind of pushed back against. So I'm curious to see how Lawrence will, um, you know, have his perspective shifts shifted in this book like he did in the last book with how he viewed the female dragon riders. But anyway, it's been a slow, political, intimate um, start. So now Lawrence and Temeraire are on their way back to China. They have to appeal to the Chinese court and um, hopefully keep their bond. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's been, again, it's a slow paced book, much more slow paced than book one was, but I'm loving it because I'm already so invested in everything. So getting more into the, the, the smaller turmoil and, uh, I will check in with you when I finish the book. Welcome to the vlog. Hello. So this is a two week reading vlog. Um, I just didn't read enough last week for it to be a satisfying video. So we're getting two weeks. Um, so I'm going to give you a quick update to let you know that I finished. Thro Throne of Jade, and it was great. It was much slower, I felt. It was much slower than book one, which was really interesting because a good, a good group of us are reading it together on my Discord, and about half of us said that, yeah, this book was a lot slower than book one, but it was necessary, and then about half said, this was way better than book one, and it was not slow at all. So, mileage ver may vary, I guess. But, um, so, I told you what the the inciting incident is and what they were doing. There was a decent amount of travel um, in this book, which I think probably helped or I think didn't help with it feeling on the slower side of things. But then also instead of there being this big, so in book one, Lawrence and Temeraire, they meet, their whole world is turned up, well, especially Lawrence, his entire world is turned upside down. They're introduced to the dragon riding world and culture, and then they're, in, they, they're starting to take part in a different type 
of warfare. They're, they're playing a different role in this time in history, and they have to figure out how to do that and adapt. And in book two, we're now traveling to a different culture, but it's a lot of travel and it's a lot of internal conflicts. Still really well written, still very good, just different. So, for instance, the main thing that I felt like they had to work through and overcome was this was this realization, wait, are we not a perfect match? Are we not the best thing for each other? It feels like we are. Our bond is strong enough that it sure does seem that way, but are we? Because Temeraire really likes Chinese spices in his foods, and I can't provide that. And Temeraire starts to have re relationships and bonds with other people or other dragons, and wants to learn to write, and is constantly challenging Lawrence in his uh, in his perspective as a British naval man during wartime, and is like, okay, but why? Why is this the way you handle things? Why is this the way you view these people? or this uh, this type of warfare and stuff like that. And then also just challenging, how much agency do I have? How much freedom do I have as a dragon who is apparently going like being forced to live this life and to, and to pursue this destiny? What if I don't wanna? So I love how much Temeraire is constantly challenging things and making Lawrence look at the world. I think it was a really essential book for bonding the two even more deeply and realizing that they will not always grow in the same direction, but they can make strides to make sure that they grow together and not apart. Anyway, very, very enjoyable book two. I did like book one better, but I very much enjoyed book two. I think that it was an essential piece of their story, and I'm looking forward to book three. We're reading these every other month, so that will be read again soon. Then I started The Sons of Darkness, <laughs> and wow, what a book. So this is, an, this is an epic fantasy, grimdark, set in ancient India, and it's so much, it's so much just from the start. We have multiple perspectives, we have a ton of lore, um, so much going on that it felt very overwhelming at first. In the beginning of the book, I was just like, oh my goodness, there's so much to keep track of, there's so much going on. And I wasn't sure that I was gonna make it, but I pushed through the beginning and it took about, Truthfully, it took like 175 pages. I, I know it's not easy, but it took about that long for it to finally start clicking and coming together. And I started understanding the direction that it was going in and got really invested. But I'm starting to really latch onto some of these characters. The plot is really picking up. I'm at uh, 250 pages now, so almost the halfway point. And there's things that are getting me a lot more invested now and a lot more excited about the direction that it's going in. It's definitely dark. There's, I mean, even just in the prologue and first chapter, there's some pretty grim things going on, but it's not a constant in the book. It just kind of crops up here and there, so I can stomach it. I'm not sure I'm ready to summarize it or give you an idea of what the plot or structure of this is just yet, other than just multiple POVs, big lore, lots going on here at the beginning. Um, I need to be a little bit further before I feel confident in doing that, but I will say that in the author note in the beginning, he says that this is based off of the Maharabata, which is, um, and the, the, I think it's the biggest epic poem ever written, but it's a big piece of Indian history and stories that a lot of kids grow up hearing and know really, really well. So it's based off of that, but with a grim, dark tilt. So, um, a Song of Ice and Fire, Malazan, First Law, definitely feeling some First Law uh, inspirations in the way he's writing some of these characters and some of the things going on. And he's taking the Maharabata and he's changing some things with a grimdark tilt, but also changing some of the characters and their perspectives and the things that they've done. Now, I don't know hardly anything about the Maharabata, so I looked up a video summarizing it, which has helped a lot to help me keep track of what's going on. But anyway, those are my first initial impressions. Very overwhelming. It was a rough start, honestly. It was a pretty rough start. Very overwhelming, a lot to keep track of, and just like, I just couldn't find myself, I couldn't find anything to anchor myself to. I couldn't find any characters that I actually cared about enough to be like, okay, at least I'm a attached to something. And I think that was probably my biggest issue with having a hard time at the beginning because I'm such a character reader and I just, there was no character for me to latch onto in the beginning. But now I do have characters to latch onto and so now I feel like I'm moving a lot easier through it. So initial impressions, I'm hopeful. <laughs> 
that's where I am. Hello. So I finished Sons of Darkness and oh, do I have so many thoughts for you. I just filmed the wrap up. So now I'm gonna try to, well, bundle up because it's cold outside and try to give you some more detailed thoughts about this book because I, I have a lot, I have a lot of thoughts. So this book has, I think, seven point of view uh, characters plus a myriad of uh, side characters and many of them don't come until later in the book. These characters are significantly different on different journeys with different motiv motivations from different regions and at, for, at, for a good chunk of the book it's just a lot of stuff getting built up and getting put into place and the second half when things start to converge come together and just move that's when the story really takes off. I think a big part of why the beginning was so tricky for me part of it is because it was a lot of information at the front of the story and it was just difficult for me to get my footing but I think another piece of it is because <clears throat> I'm gonna contradict myself I think a big piece of it is because of the structure of the storytelling we were jumping around so much that I felt like I couldn't get attached to anyone I didn't feel like I was deeply knowing any single character and so it just took me so long to get attached to them but then there were characters that came in later that I got attached to right away like the pirate princess or one character who gets us very closely acquainted or as closely as we're gonna get acquainted gets us acquainted <laughs> with the magic system in this book characters that immediately I'm like oh I like you. I want to get to know you better. There are some characters that I felt were brilliantly written that I got to know really, really closely, and I feel like I cannot wait to see where their story leads. And then there are other characters that I don't really feel like I ever got to know that well, even though I think I should have. Like, for instance, one character who made some really big decisions in this book, and there were times where I was like, but what's the motivation? You know, I really had to fill in the gaps of why did you choose to do this? Why did you choose to go this route? What was what was the point? Or rather, what was the deciding factor? Like big, big changes that would happen. And I'm just left going, okay, but, but why'd you choose this? And if we're in this character's head, I feel like she should be processing these big things too. But then watch me contradict myself there's another character that i loved following that made some huge decisions like big betrayal plots i'm not telling you what character don't worry but like big things that i did not see coming and it was the probably it was one of the best parts of the book it was a great reveal it was amazing if i were i'm i'm in this character's perspective and if i were more intimately in this person's perspective then i would hear the thoughts and i would I would know what was going to happen before it had. I would have missed the reveal. So, <laughs> I don't know. There are times where I wish we were a little bit more intimately acquainted, acquainted with, with why, like what makes these characters tick. And then there were other times where I felt satisfied with the amount that we got from them. There were times where I felt excited about not knowing as much as I could know and then getting the reveals along with the story. And there were other times where I was like, why are we doing this? So I feel so mixed. I will say that every character in this book is morally gray. Um, this is not, <laughs> This is not heroes and anti-heroes. These are characters in dark world surviving it and making choices that they deem correct. And sometimes that means that they're hypocritical. Sometimes that means that they are doing some crazy stuff to preserve themselves or others. That means that sometimes they go to dark places. Sometimes other characters go to dark places and it's, it, it's rough. There's, speaking of rough, it's a rough read at times. There are certain, you know, this is this is grimdark, or at least that's what the author's note called it. And um, yeah, there's some really, really dark scenes. There's certain chapters that uh, I'm just really glad the whole book wasn't like those few chapters, but there were some chapters that were rough to read. I wouldn't say that it revels in the darkness at any point. I don't think that it's just constantly throwing gritty scenes at you just to be like, look, I'm grimdark. Um, but they're there and they're not easy to read. I do think that when the story came together and when the characters POV started to come together and when things just in the second half of the book, 
it was so satisfying the slow build the very the rough start for me paid off big time uh so i'm so glad that i did push through the beginning because i loved the second half of this book so much and the action sequences in this book are so <laughs> gripping but also sometimes this book is super confusing <laughs> like there were there were times where so i did i tell you i don't I think I told you in the last clip that I, when I started this book, I looked up videos just summarizing the Maharabata so that I could um, just like, you know, have a little bit of history behind me. Usually I like to read source material, but this is like a thousand page, more than a thousand page epic poem. So I didn't do that. I just read, watched some summary videos. And um, there are times that I think that if I hadn't watched those videos, there would be scenes that I would not have been able to make heads or tails of. Um, so I'm really glad that I did watch that. And then there were other scenes that I was like, hey, I think I know where this is going because because I saw I read the summaries or watched the summary. So, you know, pros and cons. There's a lot of great things explored through the characters and their perspectives and their personal journeys and struggles as well. Stuff like, um, you know, class syst systems and railing against the powers that be and how um, how the the ways that they're oppressing political maneuvering and revenge and a lot of interesting stuff happening with the characters. I will say I mentioned in my last clip that I strongly see the inspiration for the first law in this book. Oh my goodness. <laughs> then then I kept reading and then it was like, wow. <laughs> wow. Um, the thing is, uh, Gaurav Mahati wears his inspiration on his sleeve to the point that it, sometimes it eeps into being derivative. For instance, there's one character who uh, has had his teeth bashed out. He has a leg that gives him a lot of trouble. Sometimes he's referred to as the cripple. He, the way he speaks, his speech patterns, his inner monologues, the way he carries himself, he's Glockta from the first law. He, he just, he is. There's even scenes that are like, like him looking at the stairs and thinking about how much he hates those stairs and like scenes that are like lifted from the first law. I mean, I can understand being inspired by Glockta. He's a brilliant character, but I think that I would have preferred to see certain characters and scenes be more transformative in the way those inspirations manifested in this novel and less like, pluck that out of there and put it here. Overall, I have so many thoughts about this book. I loved the way it ended. I thought it had a fantastic ending, really satisfying conclusion, but also still kind of leading you really cleanly into the sequel, promising what's to come. There was so much that I enjoyed about this, but also, I have plenty of critiques as well. I think I will read the sequel. I'm really, really interested to see the magic that the chakras and like the things that are introduced and how the very subtle ways in which magic is being introduced in book one, I wanna see it kind of expanded into the sequel, certain characters that I wish I got more out of in book one, I think I'm gonna get more from in the next book. And the world is fascinating. It's probably a little bit darker <laughs> than I always wanna be reading. So I don't know if I'll read it on release, but there's a lot that I really, really enjoyed about this book. Plenty that I'm also looking forward to the series grow in. So lots of thoughts. I know this was a really long check-in, but there's a lot going on in this book. Now I have started A Drop of Venom. So this is a YA fantasy following a girl named Manisha, who she is a member of, uh, her people are called the Naga, and they have been forced into it's not been good. They've been forced into like the outskirts of society and they've been mistreated. And now Manisha is going into the temples to, it, she's hiding that she's a Naga. And this is supposed to be a place where she's going to be safe, kept safe. But in fact, the author's note at the very beginning of the book lets us know that there will be an on screen, on page, on page sexual assault that will uh, lead to her being pushed into a pit of vipers, bit up but she's fine and also now she can sick those vipers on other people that's what i'm that's i'm very 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 early on you can't even see my bookmark very early on with my reading of this <laughs> um so a lot of what i just told you is just from the description and then there's also going to be a monster hunter that we're going to be following as well anyway 
my niece wants to read this, so I'm pre-reading it for her to make sure that it's not going to be too dark for her. So I should, I should have this done by the end of the vlog, I would think. I've started it and I think the writing is beautiful. I already am completely hooked and I've just barely begun. So fingers crossed. Hi, I didn't actually finish the book, so I will talk to you about it next week. So it's all in one place. Sorry if that's annoying.